Welcome back to Myth Vision, Dr. Bart Ehrman. I'm looking forward to this course that you have, The Unknown Gospel. Can you tell us a little bit about this course that you're doing soon? Yeah, it's actually called The Unknown Jesus, <laughs> which is even worse. <laughs> because, uh, and it, I call it The Unknown Jesus because uh, it's the, the, the course is about Mark, the Gospel of Mark, uh, eight lecture course. Uh, dealing with all, with a lot of the intricacies of Mark, which is my, uh, it's I mean it's my favorite gospel. I I really like the gospel of Mark, and um, I'm calling it the unknown Jesus because it's a it's a striking feature of Mark's gospel. We that that uh, he wants to proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah. And he, he tries to show Jesus the Messiah, tries to show how he's the Messiah. And Mark has this distinctive thing that nobody can, nobody knows it from the gospel. Jesus is an, un, an unknown Messiah. Uh, and you don't expect that. Uh, and people don't see it. People don't see it because they know the other gospels and they know what the other gospels say. And the other gospels don't do this. Mark does it. Jesus, nobody can figure out Jesus and Mark. And so it's really, it makes it really interesting. This is a very important point that I'm learning more and more. I mean, I've heard it, but it's like almost like epiphanies when you hear something and then it finally really dawns on you. There's an entanglement that happens with these later gospels on understanding Mark and how do we read Mark as Mark. You're going to be doing that in this course, and I hope people will tune in. Um, I want to talk about a big issue with this because we're not just reading a gospel. We're also misunderstanding Mark's Jesus, which is a very important point of your course. Yeah. And so I want to ask, if you don't mind, can you give me maybe three points of evidence that suggest why the consensus scholarship says Mark and priority. That means the gospel of Mark, for those who are watching, is the very first gospel among all the gospels. Yeah. So Mark, yeah, Mark and priority. Mark is prior uh, to the others. And that's usually said specifically about the, uh, about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, those three, the synoptic gospels. Um, it's prior to John too. But the issue of Mark and priority is that uh, Matthew and Luke both used Mark if it was prior. These three Gospels have so many uh, commonalities. They they tell pretty much they tell they tell a lot of the same stories. Mo almost all of Mark is in in Matthew, and m most of it's in Luke. And sometimes the story they're always in the same, almost always in the same sequence and the same words. And so somebody's copying somebody. And so th that's how you get these commonalities is because somebody's copying somebody. And if Mike is Mark is prior, then Matthew and Luke are both copied. Mark. Um, and so there are reasons for thinking all of that. But but the point is, if they copied it, they've also changed it. And so you can see how they've changed it to see what they're trying to emphasize. And so you really have to emphasize if, if Mark is prior, it ends up mattering because then you can see how the, it gets changed. Uh, so the, your question is, why? You know, what makes you think so? <laughs> and so the idea that Mark is prior is, uh, has been the dominant view, by far the dominant view since the 19th century, since uh, scholars started working seriously. Uh, they, they start working seriously on the synoptic issue uh, back in the 18th century, but in the 19th century, they established that Mark was prior for a variety of reasons. What some of the reasons are kind of complicated. <laughs> It'd take a while. I should probably do a whole course on this this problem. But but part of the issue is that um, when um, when when you've got Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they often tell the same stories, and often it's the same wording. Sometimes Matthew, uh, sometimes sometimes Matthew will have something different from Mark and Luke, but Mark and Luke will agree. And sometimes Luke will have something different from Matthew and Mark, but Matthew and Mark will agree. And um, and so you've got Matthew, Mark, and, and sometimes all three of them are different, and sometimes all three are the same. What you almost never get is uh, where Matthew and Luke are uh, agreeing uh, against Mark. And so. In other words, where they both have something and Mark has something something else. So if you, it takes a while to explain it, but what that shows is that they're both copying Mark. Because if, if they're both copying Mark, they sometimes all three get the same thing. Uh, sometimes they both change things in different ways, so they get different things. Sometimes Matthew will change something and Luke won't, so Matthew, and Mark, Luke, Mark, and Luke agree. Sometimes Luke will change something and Mark doesn't, so Mark and Matthew, Mark. And so, and so, so like if you work it out, it, well, Mark's got to be the one they're copying and not the other, way, not some other way around. So that's yeah. So that's, that's one thing. Another thing is Mark has a number of passages that are found in Matthew and Luke 
that both of them change in some way, but in different ways where like there's this awkward statement, like a weird phrase or um, – or sometimes they'll change it the same way. Like Mark will say something, they'll both say, wow, that's a little bit weird. And so they'll both take it out. Um, as an example for that, when when the uh, rich young man asks Jesus which commandments he has to keep in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says, well, yeah, don't, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't bear false witness, and don't defraud. Don't defraud. Wait, they ain't one of the Ten Commandments. <laughs> both Matthew and Luke drop it. You see, so so what they're so what's happening is it looks like they're both imp- trying to improve Mark grammatically and in terms of some of the content, and so that's another reason for thinking that uh, that they uh, that they both copied that they both copied Mark, uh, and so anyway, the, when scholars work on the synoptic problem, that the synoptic problem is how you have these three so much alike and yet having differences. Mark and priority is almost always the uh is the way they go thank you for that i'm sure there's so much more and (laughs) we just don't have the time to cover but i think it's important emphasizing this because my goal with this video is to kind of highlight the evangelical fundamentalist approach really gets it really gets smashed just to be frank when we take a very careful approach a critical approach in trying to understand mark as mark what i mean is one can do interpretations later But if we're being honest with Mark's gospel and we see it as first, how we understand Jesus in Mark, how we understand the message of Mark, the teaching of the gospel, what's going on, all of that gets um, impacted, if that makes sense, or has an impact um, when we're looking at it this way. So the ending of Mark ends, obviously, tragic. The women were afraid and told no one. And there seems to be these added additions to the ending of Mark, does that play any role in the scholarship's mind of why um, Mark may have come first? I mean, obviously it ends abruptly, but having all these additional that don't even agree with endings, doesn't that also imply that like, hey, as early as we can possibly go back, there was no ending and they want to make it fit with the later gospels. Yeah. So the, um, so as you're, you're right, when Mark, you know, a lot, a lot of people say, you know, a lot of people on the kind of more skeptical side of reading things say that uh, Mark doesn't have a resurrection narrative. Uh, I hear that a lot. And it's, it's not true. Mark does have a resurrection narrative. The women go to the tomb after Jesus has been buried. Uh, they go on the third day and the tomb's empty. Uh, a young man there tells them that Jesus has been raised from the dead and they're supposed to go tell the disciples that Jesus will meet them in Galilee. And so, and then, as you said, it's verse eight of chapter 16 says, and the women fled from the tomb and they didn't say anything to anyone because they were afraid. <laughs> Boom. And, ah! <laughs> and, so, and so Jesus is definitely raised. There's a resurrection narrative. What there's not are appearances of Jesus to the disciples afterwards. But you get that in Matthew and Luke and John. And um, so... I would not. I would not say that that's necessarily an argument for Mark and priority, because you could say, well, you know, actually, he thought it'd be more stunning if they didn't tell anybody, so he changed the ending. You could. You. It doesn't say that it's prior, but it does say, oh man, is that different? <laughs> because in in Matthew, so the women don't tell anyone to anything, anyone thing to anyone. They're afraid. In Matthew, they go off and tell the disciples, and the disciples go up to Galilee and they meet Jesus there. It's just the opposite. People say, "Well, Mark means he d- they didn't tell him. They didn't tell them right away." <laughs> no, I mean that isn't how it works. If I say, if I say to you, Derek, so Derek, you shared you know, like a personal secret to me, and uh, you know, and your uh, your friend John two weeks later comes up to you and says, "Oh yeah, you know, I heard this about you." Then you say, "Bart, you said you didn't tell anyone." And I say, oh, I didn't tell anyone, did not tell anyone, you know, for the first 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say it that way. But Mark says they didn't tell anyone. And in Matthew, they tell. And of course, in the others, they also. And so, uh, yeah, so it's different. And that's the main thing. You, If you don't read Mark for what Mark is saying, you completely miss it. You complete, you miss his point everywhere if you think he's saying the same thing as Matthew or John or Luke or whatever. And, and just to emphasize your point, what I was, I guess, getting at is maybe it's common sense. I don't know. But like 
it's kind of in that dissimilarity uh, argument of embarrassment kind of approach that makes you wonder this one would be prior. Like whatever the example may be, it seems like there's a a way of correcting this mark version. And most scholars kind of see that in, in the material like, oh, we got to have them tell everybody. I mean, how's the gospel out here? How's Christianity exist? Mark doesn't really give us that. Let's fix it. Is that a thrust of an argument for Mark and priority that a lot of scholars use in Mark and then comparing it to Matthew and Luke? Uh, they tend not to use that argument about the ending. Uh, and it, because they, they can. I mean, you could make an argument. You could make that as an argument. But I think the counter to it is that, that, you, um, that you can have people come up with weird things because they think it's striking. Because the, the deal is, is that Mark knows that Jesus appeared to the disciples in Galilee. He has that tradition. Because he tells the he he tells the women go tell the disciples to go to Galilee. That seems to presuppose that he knows Jesus is going to see the disciples in Galilee, as he does in Matthew. So I think Mark knows the tradition, but he he doesn't want to say it because he wants it to end in the with the secrecy that nobody knows. Um, so I think. Look, I mean, I think it is more likely that Mark's ending where they didn't tell anybody is the first one, and that Matthew thought, "Oh my God, are you kidding me?" <laughs> and then Matthew has them telling them, and and they go up, um, and so I, I do think that that's more that's more plausible, but I don't think it's a, a cut and dried case because I think Mark Mark had to know that the disciples found out, and yet he nonetheless ends a story without them finding out. So it doesn't it doesn't work as history. <laughs> it does not work as history because you can't say the women really never told anybody historically because then how would Mark know? <laughs> how would he know? But but you could imagine somebody crafting a story that way, in my opinion. Appreciate that. I want to ask you about the cognitive dissonance question because nobody gets it right. All the Jews are expecting a certain kind of Messiah. Uh, Second Temple Judaism. I've had a lot of academics on recently that just kind of express this about the end of like a timeline in history is going to end. There seems to be a much more deterministic approach. Mark is emphasizing a soon near end of all things, historically speaking, where God will come in and set the record straight, remove the enemies, Rome, you name it. Um, the question is the secret, so to speak, which you're going to emphasize and highlight in your course is that his death, him actually dying is Make it, that's why he's the Messiah. And in fact, Paul and his Philippians, him, and of course, uh, Romans 1, 4 kind of emphasizes by the resurrection, even though it looks like Mark might be adoptionist. Either way, the point I'm getting at and trying to get your thoughts is, do you think that cognitive dissonance best explains that, oh, well, he's the Messiah because we're going to find scriptures, Isaiah 53, suffering servant, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This helps highlight why he's the Messiah rather than why he didn't come like all the Jews expected a Messiah to come like. I think that, um, so for people who don't know, I mean, cognitive dissonance is this series that, that was developed by social psychologists, especially in the, the 1950s, to explain what happens when people have a very firm expectation of something that's going to happen. They have a very firm expectation that is able to be, theoretically, able to be shown wrong <laughs> and and that, that it's got to be something that's specific enough you could see that yeah that was wrong and then it turns out that it is wrong and cognitive dissonance is what that happens in their heads once they realize that this thing they were really committed to is completely wrong and what it says is then they come up with ways of explaining it away and so this is what you're you're saying is that jesus um the so the disciple. So I think we're talking about historically now. We're talking about like Jesus himself in history, that Jesus' disciples during his lifetime expected that he might be the Messiah or that he was the Messiah. And they had expectations of the Messiah the Jews had of the Messiah, which is he was this powerful figure who destroyed the enemy and set up, you know, Israel as a, as a sovereign state or as that it so he's he overcomes the enemy destroys the enemy and then they have that expectation and uh that could be disconfirmed and it was disconfirmed in a rather cruel way instead of uh being enthroned as king jesus was crucified and it completely <laughs> i mean you talk about disconfirmation oh my god uh we thought he was going to overthrow the romans and they just like they did they squashed him, squashed him like a mosquito <laughs> so, uh and so 
Um, the idea then is that they've got to have some way of reconciling that in their heads to make sense of what they used to think. And so there's a there's a scholar who's written a book about this. I don't know um, if your viewers will know this book by John Gager called Kingdom and Community. Uh, it was written back in the 1970s. But he argues on the basis, he, he, do, he explains co- the, how social psychologists develop their theories of cognitive dissonance. And then he applies it to the Jesus traditions. And he says that, it, that this was a moment where cognitive dissonance did kick in at the crucifixion. Um, my view of this is that, uh, I mean, I think that's absolutely right. They were trying, oh my God, <laughs> how did this happen? But then um, they, they came to believe that Jesus got raised from the dead. And um, you could argue that that was a result of cognitive dissonance, that this is the way they dealt with the fact that they were wrong. They came up with a new way of being right. Um, or you could say, you know, some of them just honestly thought they saw something or they saw they mistaken identity. You could come up with all sorts of theories. But I think what happens is once they think that Jesus was raised from the dead, then they start thinking, ah, what we were wrong about is what kind of Messiah he would be. We weren't wrong about the main point. <laughs> the main point is he was the Messiah. But now I see he was the kind of Messiah who had to die. And uh, and so that's that's I think and that's the beginning of Christianity. You know, in some ways, Jesus himself is not the beginning of Christianity. I mean, his preachings were not about having faith in his death and resurrection. Uh, so Christianity begins when when they start thinking he was this other kind of Messiah who had to die for the sins of the world. This is a fantastic point to bring up that you have changed your mind on over the decades of your research, and that is the legendary empty tomb. Um, (laughs) Mark, you know, is the first story, and especially since we're already assuming this is the first gospel, which I can't wait for you to do a course on just breaking that down. Um, So here you have the first narrative of an empty tomb, and I'm with you. I totally see a resurrection happening here. It it doesn't narrate appearances, but uh, I'm with you on that. Now, this empty tomb If you don't mind, can you give us a few reasons why you say this is legend? And then I want to get into another scholar who has a really well-known quote. I'm sure you are aware of his work. So I'll say that, you know, virtually I'm not going to be talking about this particular point in my course. The things I'm going to be doing in my course are things that historical scholars are not going to have a problem with. They'll disagree with this, that, and the other thing, but they're not going to. But this this is a view that I have that is not a majority view among historical scholars at all. (laughs) But it is my view that the empty tomb is is a legend it, that it's not it, um, that they did not discover uh, that there that Jesus' tomb was not discovered empty on the third day. Uh, I, I think it's legendary. The main reason for thinking it's legendary, I didn't come up with this, by the way. It's uh, John Dominic Crossan has been arguing this for many for decades, and I always thought it was a bit loony. <laughs> I thought, man, that's crazy. Because <laughs> he thought, he, he, Cross, Cross comes out and says he thinks Jesus' body got eaten by dogs. And it's like, uh, whoa, come on, that's a bit extreme. And I, you know, I, like everybody else in the guild, I said, yeah, no, that's crazy. But then I actually, what I did is I decided to take it seriously about 10 years ago. And I, I started. I, I read every reference I could find in every uh, Roman author or Greek author about crucifixion, especially Roman authors, but you're sometimes writing in Greek about what hap- what Romans did with crucifixion. And one of the kind of consistent motifs, say nobody describes the ev- the process of crucifixion. They don't describe actually how they do it, unfortunately, because we'd love to know. But uh, and so people have assumptions about how they did it, but we don't. But they. Um, but they do sometimes talk about what happens after the person dies. And what they say in every case is that the person was left on the on the cross to begin to deteriorate on the to deteriorate on the cross, to rot on the cross and and to be eaten by scavengers. Um, and so this was part of the punishment. The Romans wanted to show that you you not just they would torture you to death, they'd leave your corpse to be desecrated. And people hated that in the ancient world. And people today wouldn't like it much. <laughs> but in the ancient world, this was horrifying that you, your corpse would not be given a proper burial. But that was that's part of the punishment. You don't get a proper burial. So um, I don't think they made an exception in the case of Jesus, um, You know, certainly not because he was the son of God. Um, people think Jesus was exceptional. And of course, 
he was. I mean, there are two billion people who, who worship him today, but he wasn't exceptional in the eyes of the Romans, and they killed him the way they killed other criminals against the state. They crucified him, and so I think they just left him on the cross. Um, the idea of Joseph of Arimathea burying him—you get it in all—you get it in all four gospels. We don't know uh, of this person otherwise. He's from Arimathea. We don't know of a town called Arimathea at the time. Um, there are um, the accounts themselves uh, certainly have odds. They're at odds with each other in some ways. But um, I think that base, my basic view is that the Romans didn't treat Jesus differently from anyone else, and they left him on the cross. And people say, yeah, well, Jews didn't allow that to happen, though. They had to bury them the next day. Yeah, if a Jew... If you were killed by a Jewish authority, you had to be buried that day. But Romans didn't give a damn about what the Jews' policies were. Oh, but they wouldn't want to riot. You know, they don't want to upset. Are you kidding me? Why do you think they're crucifying people? <laughs> they love they love getting you ticked off at them. That They're crucifying you and doing this to show you better not rebel. And if you do rebel, this is what will happen to you. Uh, and so um, I, I just don't think that Jesus was buried that day. I don't think he was buried on the day he died. I don't think it happened in the Roman world. Just to add to that, is it also a common theme that uh, divine men were, you know, there was empty tombs. Do you think that the Mediterranean concept of empty tomb playing a, a role in this narrative also just helps account for that? Like Robin Faith Walsh, I asked this recently and, and she said, yeah, I think that an empty tomb is a signal or kind of like a motif you would imagine in the Mediterranean world for someone becoming a god. Well, it's an interesting point, and I don't know of other empty tomb narratives per se, and I don't know if she's referring to something specific uh, about an empty tomb. What is the proof is that the body's no longer here. Um, and so you get that going back in uh, Greek and Roman legend, uh, and for example, Romulus. Um, is kind of a, a key point because everybody knew the story of Romulus, and the story was that he was he was he, the troops were marshaled in front of him. They were having this big military parade, and the uh, and he's sitting on you know on the stand, and the senators are all around him watching the troops go by, and then the storm comes up and gets dark, and fog comes down. There's lightning and thunder. You can't see anything, and the th finally the storm lifts, and Romulus ain't there. <laughs> <laughs> and so the um, there were two two stories about it. One story was that the uh, senators took the opportunity and and ripped him to shreds and <laughs> the parts of his body because they didn't like him ruling over them. But the other story that the senators swore to was that he had been taken up and been made a god. And their evidence was he's not here. And they actually there was a there was a man who said, "Oh yes, he appeared to me later and he talked with me and he explained to me what had happened." And then Romulus becomes the god Quirinus because he go and the evidence is not he's not here. So when somebody's not there, well where are they? <laughs> and so and anybody who's taken up to heaven is made a, a divine being. So Robin may have meant meant that, I don't know, or maybe she knows about empty tombs that I don't I don't know about and uh, that's that's entirely possible. Yeah, she is in the classicist vein, so I'm sure she's read things, you know how it is. Um I, I would Yeah, like but to I mean I, <laughs> Yeah, I read the classics too. <laughs> right, I'm uh, just saying maybe I'm wondering she's... what she, I don't know what she would have in mind. Um Gotcha. I'll have her. I'll have to get her to emphasize that. Here's a quotation. My good friend Derek Bennett did a recent response to, um, but he used this quote. I'm just going to give you this. It's, the important point is that in the primitive preaching, resurrection and exaltation belong together as two sides of one coin. Hence the designation resurrection exaltation, and that it implies a geographic transfer from earth to heaven. Hence it is possible to say that in the primitive charisma, Resurrection is resurrection to heaven. To summarize the general conviction in the earliest Christian preaching is that as of the day of his resurrection, Jesus was in heaven, seated at the right hand of God. Resurrection and exaltation were regarded as two sides of one coin. Resurrection meant resurrection to heaven or resurrection from grave to glory. A.W. Zweep, the ascension of Messiah in Luke and Christology. That those later gospels want to give him more earthly time of like spending time with with the with the disciples and even john wants to say hey don't touch me i haven't gone up yet um in mark it seems he goes from the grave up are you in agreement that this is like grave up to heaven or do you think he has a sojourn before he actually goes up i mean it doesn't really tell us but paul right. seems to have from grave up I agree with his. I, I agree with this 
view that the earliest Christians thought that it's from the grave up. And I think that they, they, um, uh, they thought being raised from the dead does not mean you kind of hang around for 40 days or something like that. They didn't, th the earliest Christians thought he had been, that the resurrection was also the exaltation. When he says, when he, when he refers, he sounds like he's referring to a term resurrection exaltation as a single term. And of course that's not in the Bible or anywhere. I think that's a modern term that he's, so it sounds like he's saying, you know, that's why people called it that. Well, I don't know that anybody called it that, but that they didn't have to because that's what the idea meant. The resurrection wasn't uh, a revivification of a, of a corpse. It was a, uh, it was, it was a deification. Uh, and so that happens when you go up. So I, I agree with that. Uh, the problem is that our authors, of course, are living, uh, our, our earliest authors, Paul, and he's writing a couple of decades after the event. And Mark is probably writing about four decades after the event. And I'm not sure that either one of them has that view. I'm, the reason I hesitate on Mark is because um, Mark says that uh, that they're to go to Galilee because so, Jesus will appear to them there. Now it may mean that Jesus has gone up and he's going to come back down for you know to see you. Uh, it, it could be that, um, and maybe that's what Paul thinks too. Um, but he clearly says that he was raised on the on the third day and that he appeared to uh, Cephas and then to the 12. And so it, it doesn't sound like he's going up and down. You could argue that he's going up and down because Paul does say that then last of all, he appeared to me and he's, he seems to be assuming that it's the, in the same way as he appeared to the others. Well, you know, Paul's is two or three years later, so clearly wasn't the same. <laughs> he clearly he was Jesus wasn't hanging around until then, and so maybe Paul does think that he's going up and down. That's that's a good question, and maybe Mark does too. The one thing that I'll say is that in the um, the uh, the Gospel of John does assume that it's going to be back on earth and then ascend. The only ascension, actual reference to an ascension, uh, literal like of it happening, is in the book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John don't narrate an ascension. And so what is often thought is that Jesus was a, Jesus died. His disciples thought he got raised from the dead, which meant that he was, he was taken all the way up. Then they, you know, one of the evidence of the resurrection was the appearances. And so they started thinking, well, he was around for a while before he went up. Luke has him around for 40 days and then he goes up and then, and then Luke narrates uh, him going up. Um, it is interesting, though, that that's in the book of Acts. In the Gospel of Luke, written by the same guy, Jesus meets the disciples on the day he gets raised from the dead. And then he goes up that day. Uh, and so Luke appears to have both traditions. Mm. Even so, though in, 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 in the gospel, Luke, he doesn't go straight up, though. He, he spends a few hours on earth. For, he goes to the road of Emmaus and he meets some people. Then he goes. But it's the same day, at least. So I think that's a kind of moving toward the idea that he's around for a while. I think it's fair to say that if you're an evangelical fundamentalist, you might want to sign up for the course and check out what Dr. <laughs> Bart D. Ehrman has to say. And not because he's interested in deconverting you. I have no quarrels either with people who believe. In fact, my goal is to, just like you, Dr. Ehrman, have people become more educated. I think it will, it will reduce harm in the long run for some of the beliefs I do find within some of these circles. So, um, I hope that we can get people to come sign up. If you want, again, why should people sign up? Well, it's not, you know, it's not a course for any particular religious persuasion. I mean, this is a, this is a course, an eight lecture course on one of the most important pieces of literature in our civilization that nobody, no, almost very few people really understand what's going in the gospel of Mark. Um, uh, historian scholars, biblical scholars have studied it intensely. And it turns out it's just a really interesting book. It's, for me, uh, I may have said this already. It's it's my favorite gospel of the New Testament. It's my favorite book, probably my favorite book of the Bible, because it is genius in ways that people just don't see until it gets pointed out to them. Uh, and so I'll be talking about the distinctive message of Mark and how why it's really interesting and 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 what it's the unexpected themes 
in it and uh, talking about things like how scribes change the story in places. <laughs> and I'll have a couple of lectures on that and on how, you know, it turns out to be a different gospel if you change the story, change the words in places and, uh, and, all, and all that. So it's going to be it's going to be informative. It's not going to be trying to persuade anybody of a particular religious view, but it, it will be significant to anybody, whether they're a believer or not. 